Good morning. It's wonderful to have you this Sunday morning, the day of the Lord. We are excited and I am excited that we can gather together in the name of the Lord to um, hear his word and to consider what he's uh, taught us throughout the months and years and to act upon his word. So you're most welcome if you're visiting us for the first time, feel welcomed and uh, we we love Jesus and we love his word, so we are going to go straight to our study for today, that is Acts 17. Before we read, let us ask for God's blessing over his word. Oh Lord our God, we are before you once again. We ask for your grace and mercy as we receive your word, as we read it publicly, as you have commanded us, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work in us as we pay attention to it, and that will be fruitful as we consider to do what you have uh, spoken to us. This morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to comprehend the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. We continue with this second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, uh, sliding into chapter 17, still on the road, preaching the gospel, uh, going into the synagogues, getting kicked out of different places, but he keeps on teaching and preaching God's word. Last week we saw that uh, they were accused and brought in and they prayed and the Lord was gracious enough to break the, uh, the, the doors and the chains fell off. Now the Bible says, so they went out of prison and entered the house of Lydia and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scripture, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying that Jesus, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and great multitude of the devout Greek, not, us, not a few of them leading women, Join Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathering a mob, set all the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decree of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they had this thing. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And it continues in 
like manner. Now, it is important to notice a few things as Paul is um, on the journey going from these places uh, preaching the gospel. The, the distance was not far much detached. Perhaps it was a one day's journey, like um, 30 miles, 33 miles, uh, thereabout. And Paul, when he went to Thessalonica, the first place that Paul would always go would be in the synagogues, as was his custom. And the Bible tells us here that in uh, three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scripture, not from his own mind, his own opinion. He considered what the word God says um, above his opinion. Thessalonica was an important city where many people lived and traded, uh, and a lot of Jews also lived there. And customarily, as we have read, Paul went into the synagogue. You know, it is written in Romans. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 16. Therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Sometimes we might be wondering about the, uh, the flow of thought about it. Uh, why Jews fast? Why not the Gentile fast? These were the chosen people of God who were to understand the prophecies and what was foretold about the Messiah. So as they gathered in the synagogues to receive all the scrolls to be read to them, um, they were supposed to comprehend or to understand that everything that was said about the Messiah has actually been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But yet they did not understand. So if you'd go to the people who never knew it, it would be, they would understand, but the process would be slow. But God appointed that they would receive first the gospel, the Jewish people, for those who would believe, and then to the Gentiles who would comprehend the story of God. So he would go into the Jewish synagogues to um, reason with them. Do you know how fast you can learn things? You can first learn things when you teach them to other people. When you have a concept that you have learned and you're sharing with other people, automatically you kind of have the desire to learn another concept so that you can share with people. And this became the desires and the joy of these early churches, when the gospel is preached to them, the desire within them would cause them to go out on the streets. Even when the situation was not favorable, they would go on the streets and to preach the gospel. You come and people would ask you questions. And you know what? You will not always have all the answers. You know where you go back? You go back to the scripture, you learn, and you go back to the streets again to learn, to, to, to share what you have learned with people. So you learn faster when you tell what you know to someone else. And that is how these churches grow. One principle that I learned in this chapter that is very important for every one of us to grasp is that the Christian faith is reasonable in that it can be explained and God's power would be demonstrated when it is spoken. It is reasonable. You can reason with people. You can talk to people. You can have a dialogue with people. Sometimes, you know, you share the gospel with people and they get mad at you 
for, for sharing the gospel. They, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear God. They don't want, because they've been offended in one way or another. And they want to accuse God for any bad thing that has happened to them. I don't want to hear God. Oh, why did he allow this and that to happen to me? It is very reasonable. The Bible says that he, all these three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scripture, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying that this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, says here in verses four, and the beginning of verses five, but the Jews who were not persuaded. So this is what we're gonna talk about today, the effects of the gospel, the effects of the gospel. And we'll see this aspect playing over and over, that first of all, the gospel would be received, the gospel would be rejected, and also the gospel will be re uh, reflected upon by those who you know, are a bit skeptical, they don't know what to believe and they feel like it's, it's a nice thing. They would consider it, as we'll see at the end of this chapter. But those would play, because sometimes when you preach to people, you're like, how could they reject the word of the living God? Trust me, many people have rejected they will reject it today, tomorrow. As long as we preach, we'll have people who will reject it. As long as we preach, we'll have people who will accept it. As long as we preach, there are people who will consider it. And so those who did not consider this, the Bible said they became envious and took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob and set all the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Those who are opposing the gospel, they are mobilizing every other person to hate. Have you realized or noticed that when people are having this you know, hate towards particular people or something, they want to gather everyone so that we hate together? <laughs> You don't want to hate yourself, you, we want to, you know, all of us, let's hate this person. Let's, let's do them harm, let's do these things. And we, we do them. It, and it goes both ways, even when, when you love some things and you love some people, you want all people to love them, right? <laughs> it's just human nature. And these people, they're not excited about what is happening, they're not excited about the gospel, the gospel that was uh, preached to them. They have read scrolls in the temple or in the synagogues, but it has nothing to do with them. There's no fruit. There's no fruit. They, they're not growing in the Lord. They don't know Jesus Christ, though they read about him. They study about him in the scrolls, in the laws of Moses but they're getting mad and they're getting furious and now they are gathering people against the, um, the man of God. They know where they're staying at Jason's house, so they say, hey, you are the one harboring these criminals. That was an accusation. We are going to bring you to before the, the rulers, before the chiefs, But when they did not find them, they did not find Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out, these men have turned the world upside down and they have come here too. <laughs> it, is, it is quite known, it is quite evident what they do, it is quite evident from their testimony what they have done from town to town though they did have mobile phones and you know, faster means of communication, but we see that these things are happening too fast. They go to this town, it is known what they're doing. 
Maybe they got that information from the first missionary journey and they know for sure what they did and how they've been traveling, preaching about Jesus. People are getting born again. You know, these synagogues are becoming smaller in number and other people are becoming Christians. They're, they're beginning to love the Lord and they don't like it. It's like we gotta do something about it. They say for sure that these people are turning the world upside down. Do you know what we ought to do as God's people? To turn things around all the time. Not one time, not just today, or not just you know, glorying in the former glory. You know, one time the Lord used you mightily and you want to suppose that it is going to happen that way every day. No, 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 no. You need a fresh uh, uh, the, the power from, from God. You did it yesterday, thank God for that. God is gonna use you today differently. Are you open to be used by God? And can people say that, oh, I know these people, they're the people who are turning Eldoret upside down. Can they say that about you, about our church? Because when you serve the Lord, it is not a secret. These people who are keeping secret, they don't want people to know they're believers, they're probably not born again. <laughs> How would you hide such a beautiful thing? The knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't you want to be associated with him while you want the goodies that are associated with him? I don't want people to know that I'm a Christian, but I want him to give me life. I want good health. I want him to bless me with a, with a spouse. I want this, I want that. I want all these things in the name of God, but I don't want to be very committed to him. Their commitment was seen and known by the multitude. So they brought Jason, and this is what they say. You know, these people have turned the world upside down and have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are acting contrary to the decree of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. This was in itself a problem. Why? Because in this empire, there was only one king. Caesar. You do anything contrary to Caesar's, you'll be sentenced to death. Your punishment will be great because you did not uh, acknowledge the mighty Caesar. You remember even, you know, when people are coming behind Jesus and asking, you know, so should we pay taxes to Caesar? <laughs> Kenyans, should we pay taxes? The pressure increases when you pay taxes. No, no, no. Every citizen is supposed to pay tax. The, no government can be run without a uh, citizen paying tax. We just need to find a, a way of making them responsible to our money. We give a lot of money, and it's just, uh, you know, getting into their pockets every day, every night. Jesus say, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. The inscription says, this is Caesar's. So you guys pay tax, do what you're supposed to do as a citizen. But also give to God what belongs to God. Do you know what belongs to God? It's you. Give to God what belongs to God. Give your total self to God. And when you give your total self to God, you know what will happen? the world will be turned around. Things will change. And people will notice it. They will know for sure that you're, you are a believer. So Christian ought to have only one king who is worthy to be worshipped, and that is Jesus. You ought to proclaim him, whether it's in China, in Iraq, whatever place. 
Proclaim Jesus. Let them know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't shy away from uh, this proclamation. And this was a big deal to them. They say there's another king who is Jesus, not Caesar. They're not bowing down to Caesar. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security or bathed them, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they had arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Every place that Paul goes, you guys notice, he goes to the synagogue. He goes to the synagogues to preach the gospel. That is the first audience that he's looking for. After he's gone to the synagogues, the next place is to the marketplaces, where he will find everybody, the people who are coming for trade, and these um, religious leaders and the government, he will find them in the marketplaces. He made it a point to always go to these places. And this next location that is going, it is very important. In Berea, verses 11 say, there were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with readiness and preached. And, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they were not just dumb, dumb people who would just listen for the sake of listening. They will listen and go back and confirm with the scrolls if what you're saying is indeed true. And why are they searching? So that they would consider the validity of what you're telling them. Fair-minded people will listen and receive the word while also ready to search and verify the truth. There are people who listen and at the end of it, they, 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 they didn't get anything. For those, those who are teachers, you know, you go to class and you teach your students and after the lesson, you're so class, what did you understand? Uh, repeat. <laughs> you, you didn't get nothing. You know, you, 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 you would get frustrated as a teacher that the next class is performing well, they're, they're getting a grasp of what they're taught and the next class is, oh my gosh. They didn't get it. <laughs> These brands, the Bible say, they're they were fair-minded, all nobles. And they were noble, but remember, many of them are not Christians, but they are noble. They consider things. Because we have people who naturally, you talk to them and they, yeah, they want to consider what you, the possibilities of the things you're saying to them. And these were the Bereans. And the Bible continues to say, therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. There's people who are prominent in this city, men and women, they did what? They believed after considering this word, after searching in the scriptures that the words of Paul are actually what was written in the scrolls. Like, ah, Jesus was prophesied. He has come, he's lived amongst us. He died, rose again. That is the truth. And we are going to believe in what um, Paul preaches. And this was wonderful. That, you know, the gospel message was received. Though they fled from Thessalonica, they did not flee from the service of Christ. Because you think about you, all your life is just being chased by the government. They don't want you to preach. The religious leaders, they want you to shut up. 
They fly from this place to this place to this place, but you know one thing that is constant? They never flee from the service of the king. Whether you are in the dungeon, whether you find yourself, whatever place, never cease serving the Lord. Don't say, you know, when I was young, I was vibrant. I, I honestly get tired of those things. When I was young, I did this. When, so what are you doing right now? I don't want to hear your story when you're young. I didn't know you. I want to hear what the Lord is doing right now. What is the, 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 the Lord speaking to you to do? Where is he leading you? Leave those things of former things. God is interested in using those people who are willing to be used of God even today. The former glories, they're gone. So this man of God, they did not flee. They fled from one town to the other, but the service to the king was constant. And as many people here would be, you know, the, the, the Bible continues to say, you know, they, they reasoned with them. They reasoned with them. The doctrine of Christ does not fear scrutiny for scriptures interpret scriptures. There's always one meaning, as Pastor Josh was saying. There's always one meaning to the scripture. One meaning to what it means by one baptism, one Lord, one King. It's one meaning. It, it, it never changes. If someone wants to change it, you gotta verify from the scripture. And if they're trying to lead you astray, run away from them. Run away. These were noble people who considered and the Bible say many of them go born again. They believe both prominent women and men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred the crowd. These are busy bodies. <laughs> it's like they got no business. This is so, who is preaching in Kapsabe? Let, let's go cause trouble. Who is preaching at Kablamai? Let's go cause trouble. Who is doing the... Let, it's a miserable kind of life, right? You're just looking for trouble. You're just looking for uh, people to, you know, you want to bite their backs. <laughs> it's, it's miserable. But this is what they find pleasure in. Do you know that the Bible says that there's no rest for the wicked? <laughs> the wicked people, they, they're always busy, busy body. They just want things to do, you know, Things about people, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Sometimes tell them no. If I haven't had it, it's not important. If it's important, it will come to my ear and I will verify. And they will shy away and go. You got to put a stop to some things when people are just bringing like, oh, well, I didn't contribute, I just listened. No, you contributed 101% for your information. I didn't just, you know, they're just saying things about this husband, this wife, this pastor, this member of the church, this. No, 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 no. Whatever thing they do, is, is, is it bringing glory to God? If it's not bringing glory to God, you gotta shut it. Shut it down. There's a lot of things that we do friends, and especially for those who are called by God's name, some of those things, they do not bring glory to God. And we gotta consider running away from those things. 
these busybodies, they followed them. And you know what they did? They started the crowd again against this man who was just trying to serve the Lord. So, immediately they sent Paul away to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receive, uh, and receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him with speed and they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city and when, when he saw that the city was given over to idols. As they described this city of Athens, that when you'd go in there, you'd be mesmerized with the beauty and how they've built their buildings and all the idols that you'd see in every literal building. And you, people would go there and be like, wow, this is amazing. And Paul goes in there and say, whoa, this is not good. And he was disturbed within that the whole of this town where we have, you know, a lot of philosophers, a lot of learned friends, a lot of genius people, you know what they do? They are idol worshipers. They don't worship God, and he was disturbed from within. Friends, are you disturbed when you look at the vain glory of the unbelieving world? You look at the perishing people. You look at the condition of, you know, our governments. People running crazy, running away from God. People cannot even think straight in nowadays. And you look at the treachery of people. If you're not going to be disturbed, perhaps there's something wrong with us. If we see people perishing in sin and we are not disturbed, there's a problem. There's a problem. And therefore, he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. He had decided to, to have a little bit of rest. <laughs> but huh? he said, no, I gotta do something about it. I have to reason with these people. If they're reasonable, as they say, according to this culture, then I am going to reason up with this people. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosopher. Now he comes and encounter two groups of people. Epicureans. These were whose principles were not uh, in line with the scriptures. They had worldly opinion on what they believed, the God they believed, and you know how they would actually absorb, absorb all these gods. Literally, they say historically that every person who lived in Athens would be having their own idol. That is how many these idols were just everywhere. It's like in India. You guys know how many millions of gods are in India? Millions. You, it's not like three or four or five. It's millions of gods 
in India. And if you, you, you insist with the gospel to these not born again Indians, and they get tired, you know what they'll say? You can bring your Jesus, we'll paint it here. <laughs> we'll add another God to ours. Most of these pictures we have for Jesus, it's the Indians who have made them. That's why they look like the, the head is about to go out. <laughs> it's not stable. That is not our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he was a man who worked hard. Didn't have, you know, soft manicured and whatever face, uh, facial. He was a rough dude. He worked. We should burn all those things, those who have them in our houses. Hallelujah. <laughs> but nonetheless, they would just add to their gods. You come with another one, they add to them. They add to them like, oh, oh. One Indian guy was asked, you know, why, why, do you, why do you have a lot of gods here? To, are these gods working for you? So, well, this is, this is the god of fertility, this is the god of the world, the god of this and this. And what about this one, Jesus? At well, it's just here when he proves himself, I will worship him. <laughs> He has proven himself. He's worthy to be worshipped. He reasoned with these people. The Epicureans, who thought God altogether was such as one as themselves. So they thought God is like one of them. They would not own that God made the world or governs it, nor that man needs to make any conscience of what he says or does, having no punishment to, to fear, no rewards to hope for, all which lose you know, notions of Christianity is levels against. So the Epicureans indulge themselves in all the pleasure of this world because what mattered to them was their current happiness. That after death, everything ceases. So there's no idea of having a God who is responsible for things that are made, that, you know, there's evil and bad. We can do whatever we want in our flesh because when we die, everything ceases. So they don't want to take responsibility over anything. And then we had another group, the Stoics, who thought themselves altogether as good as God. If you say God is good, we good too. <laughs> you, you guys want to know what the level of pride? This is top notch. <laughs> You're the same as God. So if you say God is mighty, we mighty. If you say God is great, we great. And these are the people Paul is coming to talk to. This is what they say. What does this bubbler want to say? You know, they come to their own uh, county assembly and Paul is right there. It's like, so, tell us, tell us about yourself. <laughs> oh man, this... They didn't know who they were messing up with. What does this bubbler want to say? Others say he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. 
They never believe in the resurrection because after death, everything ceases. And they look and they took him and brought him before Aripagas. This was their, their, their assembly. Saying, may we know this new doctrine. May we know what this new doctrine is which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spend their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new things. So they were always interested in new things and knowledge and all that stuff. Then Paul stood in the midst of Eropagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. What, what a beautiful entry. Because looking around, you know, these are very smart fellas. These are people who are informed about things. Just come and shout at them, and they have addressed you gently. Find a way of talking to them gently. And Paul said, ah, I have observed, by the way, you guys are very religious. Man, you guys have thousands and thousands of altars dedicated to different gods. So you guys are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this in, in, inscription to the unknown God. Remember all the other gods that they know, they have named them, the Zeus and the rest. They are all known. But one of it said to the unknown God, Wonderful. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. I love Paul. <laughs> okay, you guys, you're smart. You've done all your research and perhaps you know about the God of the Hebrew. I don't know. But there's something here that I want to make known to you. You guys have a God in your altar that is not known to you. Thank God I'm here. <laughs> I want to make it known to you. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it. So if people have a problem, you know where Paul begins? Right in the beginnings. All our problems can be solved when we go back to the beginning. The Bible says in the beginning, God. So if things did not begin with God, it is a problem. You remember when they were talking about marriage and divorce, asking Jesus, he told them, you know that in the beginning, it was not so. Some of these things Moses wrote to you because your wicked, your stiff-necked people, you don't want to listen. So some rules were to be written for you to follow. You go back to the beginning. This is where um, the apostle goes back. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of the heaven and the earth, does not dwell in the temples made with hands. In other words, what is he saying? This God I'm presenting to you does not dwell in these things that you have crafted with hands. Nor is he worshipped with man's hand as though he needed anything. Since he gives lives to all. He gives. So he's the creator and the sustainer of all things. Can your God do that? I mean, if earthquakes would come here, all your gods would be down. You'd make another god. That is why you'd say that your god is like you. Because it's senseless. <laughs> all of you people don't make sense. You and, and your god. He gives 
to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grave for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of you. For in him we live and move and have our being. Also, as also some of your own poets have said, for we also his offspring. Now, you know, this, this verse is, is very beautiful. As we we'll read it, it says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Do you know that was extracted from a pagan ideology of their God? Seems correct, right? Or it, it, it feels like this is, you know, a spirit felt and inspired word. But you know, this poet that Paul is referring to were the people who brought about this idea that for in him we live, we move, and have our being. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands men everywhere to repent. Gently he's telling them that you guys are worshippers of the idols. You have been worshipping these things that you have made by your hands. They look nice. You made them with silver, gold, and precious stones. But he says that truly these times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now, now that you're hearing my voice, now that this has come to you, he commands all men everywhere to do what? To repent. <laughs> like, who was this dude telling us to repent? Repent on what? Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Speaking about resurrection, one thing that they never believed in, but nonetheless, he's bringing this to them. That when he had, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. <laughs> we will hear you again. So Paul departed from amongst them. And however, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius, the Eropagite, a woman named Damaris and others with them. Some of the people who were in that council who were questioning Paul, one of them is born again. Would it indeed be awesome you go to the governor's office and when you're done, some of them are following Jesus Christ? That would be wonderful. They, that county many things will change. Because the, the problem that we have is a sin problem. Sin problems will cause you to snatch people's resources and money 
and keep it for yourself and other things that don't belong to you. But if you have Jesus in you, you'll be a good steward of people's properties and use them right. And do you know what will happen? That part of the nation will prosper greatly. Friends, I don't know about you. I don't know if you're ever disturbed as I bring the worship team to come. I don't know if you've ever been disturbed seeing the condition of the world, people perishing and indulging in their sins. You, you have your teenagers, you have your spouses, you have your children, your brothers and sisters, your kinsmen perishing in sin and you ain't doing nothing about it. This was not the Apostle Paul. He wanted people to know Jesus from the so-called wealthy men and women to the farmers to everybody else. He wants them to know Jesus. For what profited the man if you will gain everything and lose your soul? What profit is the man? And as I mentioned earlier, you know, these are the effects of the gospel. A group of people will receive it. A group of people will reject it. And we'll have a group who will say, we will hear you again in this matter. You ought not to force them. You know, you know, you don't force people to accept Christ. You must do it right now, or else you're doomed. You preach the gospel and let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. That is not your job. You're a messenger. You speak the word and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. These people in this council, they say, when, when, um, they heard about res the, the resurrection of the dead. Some mocked, while some others said, we will hear you again on this matter. I know when you hear someone saying, I will hear you again in this matter, actually it encourages you to come again. That I will show up again. I will, I will not shy away, I will show up and share from the Bible what I've received from Christ, what I have experienced from Jesus Christ. So the ministers of Christ must not think it is enough to speak about the good news of Christ only just once a week, but we should be daily doing that. Not just once a week. This is the day that I can share the gospel. The rest of the week I can do my business and nothing of Jesus Christ. The Lord has given us a command to, to go out, to, to, to bring the harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. We have this wonderful opportunity to reach out to people. You don't got to be a pastor to do that. You don't have to be a singer to do that or a children ministry worker to do that. You just need to be a Christian to do that. You just need to be a believer to do that. Share Christ with people. Whether you're fired today, tomorrow wake up and go to the streets and say, voila, I wanna share Jesus. Christ with you. Share the love of Christ with this world that is perishing. Let us bow our heads and pray. God, we thank you again for the privilege, the privilege to 
receive your word, the privilege to be found in your house, the privilege to actually hear your heart as we go through your word. I pray that you walk in our hearts. I know you have opened doors for us to share our experiences, share our testimonies. I pray that many, many, many other doors will be opened to share the gospel with our children, our spouses, our colleagues, everywhere, sharing your word, sharing your word. For we do not know the time nor the hour. We know that you return speedily. We see the signs every day. And Lord, we are asking that you would be merciful to us, Lord. For those who have drawn back, those who have uh, been running away from serving you, I pray that you would speak to us one more time. I pray that we will not disregard your voice. But thank you, God. Anyone who needs restoration this morning, I pray that you restore them. Those who need healing, Lord, I pray that you stretch forth your hand and heal them. What a testimony. It will be awesome when we hear of what you have done in these people's lives after hearing your word. And Lord, even as we give our offerings to you, as we serve you with our finances, we pray that we'll give that which we have purposed in our hearts a percentage that will bring glory to you. So bless us as we give to you in Jesus' name, amen.